So welcome everybody to the IMAPS uh, uh, first virtual technical meeting. Uh, it's uh, our way of keeping the uh, momentum of our technical meetings going even under these present circumstances. Um, and uh, I hope you can all see the uh, uh, agenda screen that I've got. And we will begin with uh, some uh, chapter announcements from our uh, incoming chapter president, Matt Bracey. So uh, without further ado, I would like to pass uh, this over to Matt. Thanks, Richard. First, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you all for participating in IMAPS New England's very first virtual technical meeting. This has been a concept that chapter leadership has been toying with for quite some time, uh, but the current circumstances have pushed us have to undertake steps, steps to achieve, to achieve, to achieve, to achieve this. this. I'd like to thank like the members thank of the chapter members leadership for your hard work, your hard work on this task, on this task especially, task, especially the Richard, Richard, our technical, our technical meeting here. I have a few quick announcements that will get on the meeting. meeting. Sorry about that. I apologize. It's a new one for me. So, all right. So, a few quick announcements, and we'll get back to the meeting, and you guys can uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> so, first, uh, I want to say that we're looking at hosting a floating virtual symposium in lieu of our traditional symposium. So, our target date for our first session is going to be Tuesday, September 22nd. Uh, stay tuned for more information. We'll definitely be emailing uh, more stuff out as as we get more stuff formed, formed up. Uh, the second announcement is that the New England ESD chapter, in conjunction with IMAPS New England, IEEE Boston Reliability, and Boston SMTA, is hosting a free webinar on August 11th covering near-field EMC scanning method based on an e-field collapse. Registration is required and closes on August 10th at 5 p.m. Uh, we've set that out in our email recently too, I believe, right, Harvey? Um, you need any more information, shoot us an email. And uh, lastly, as this is our first virtual meeting, we welcome all feedback. Uh, please reach out and uh, I'll send it back over to Richard to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, everyone can hear me, right? Okay, good. All right, so, um, at this point, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Niels Vinance van Rissant uh, obtained his master's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Heidelberg. Um, he's uh, worked at uh, for Heidelberg Instruments as an applications engineer, as well as in the R&D group. Uh, in 1999, he founded the US Citizen Service Branch, where he served as the president until 2008. And since early 2011, he's been in charge of sales for North and South America. And today he'll be speaking on optical direct right lithography for packaging applications. So, um, and there he there he is. Now, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, So, yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, um, thank you for joining uh, me today. So, I'm Luis Finance van Rezant and I'm the Director of Sales for Heidelberg Instruments. Uh, I welcome you uh, from our Boston office. So, actually, we're, uh, we're located in Woburn, uh, so near Boston. Um, and um, I would also like to thank the organizers here of the uh, IMAPS New England chapter for giving me the uh, opportunity to present here. Um, this presentation will be about 20 minutes, and um, after the presentation, we will take the questions. Um, and so if you raise your hand, uh, we will make sure that uh, you can ask your question uh, afterwards. And I think there was a, um, a mistake in uh, how that works. So when you want to raise your hand uh, or ask a question, you can either enter that as, um, below the uh, uh, location of the, the list, or if you search your name on the list, on the right side, there is a button that uh, allows you to raise your hand. Uh, and I'm sure that then uh, after the talk, you will be uh, unmuted to. Uh, 
Um, also, my colleague Greg Morris here, um, he will also maybe uh, be able to assist in answering some of the questions. And um, okay, so let's uh, let's start. So my talk is about optical direct photography for packaging applications. Okay. Um, Now I'm having difficulty. Sorry. Okay. So um, for uh, those of you who don't know Heidelberg Instruments, I would like to uh, uh, give a short introduction. So Heidelberg Instruments is a world-leading, um, innovative, uh, high-precision maskless lithography uh, manufacturer of maskless lithography systems. Uh, beyond our micro-scale laser lithography systems, we also make uh, AFM-based uh, systems. Um, that uh, use a heating tip for nanolithography. Heidelberg Instruments is, was founded in 1984, and uh, we uh, pride ourselves to offer high quality systems and also to offer customer so support throughout the long lifetime of these systems. Our customers range from small R&D labs for a single PI to Fortune 500 industrial companies who use the tools for production. It means that we learn often, um, we learn innovative new processes, applications from research, but at the same time, we <coughs> have uh, get the experience to build reliable systems um, for the industry where uptime is key. Uh, we have some 20 year old systems uh, out there uh, that are still running in the field, and um, we sold uh, up to now, we have uh, over a thousand systems uh, installed worldwide. And so this is an overview of our different product lines that we have. So the nano fraser, as I mentioned, um, these are um, systems that um, use a heated tip and can go down to a resolution of about 20 nanometers. Uh, and this is a newer technology. It's more for R&D uh, purposes. And uh, something that is nice about it is it, it also works as an AFM. So it can actually me um, measure their own, their own pattern product as it writes it. Um, our VPG series, these are um, photo, mainly for, made for photo mass production. Um, they can uh, uh, have very large substrates up to 1.4 by 1.4 meter in size. We have a newer tool that is um, uh, the Ultra, which is designed for the 150 nanomet uh, nanometer node for semiconductor um, uh, tools. Then our DWL tools. These are, um, are, uh, are more of our original tools, so they use uh, um, Acousto optics and a, uh, a continuous wave laser for direct write applications and uh, making of photo masks. And these systems uh, also excel in grayscale lithography. So if you wanted to pattern um, uh, something like a lens, lenslet or something like that, uh, that this is the tool to go to, the DWL systems. Uh, finally, um, uh, we have our MLA tools. These are our maskless aligners. Um, these have been optimized for high throughput um, uh, at a reasonable uh, resolution. Uh, so reasonable is uh, down to one micron. Uh, we have some versions even 0.6 micron. Um, mostly are installed. Um, uh, these, the MLA150 is very popular, uh, installed at many um, universities and um, uh, also in production facilities. Some of our customers have actually now uh, owned their, um, ordered their uh, second tool. Um, so while the uh, MLA100 and the MLA150 are more for research applications, we also have a new tool. And these are, this is uh, one tool that I think uh, is particularly good for uh, packaging applications is our MLA300, which is more uh, set for an uh, industrial uh, production environment. So when we talk about uh, lithography, so the word lithography that stems from the ancient Greek, uh, where uh, lithos stands for stone and uh, um, uh, Graph uh, graphene uh, means to write, so it's to write in stone. And so actually the lithography process, as we know it, that was invented by a playwright, um, uh, Alois Senefelder in 1976 to make it very uh, easier and cheaper to uh, reproduce his scores and lyrics uh, of his works. Um, so that is actually interesting to see how that actually evolved into uh, something that is used in technology uh, nowadays everywhere. And so modern uh, photolithography 
um, is a process that we, where we use light to fabricate patterns into photosensitive films, such as photoresist, and they may be transferred to a bulk material by a deposition or, or an etch process. Lithography is uh, used in a large range of applications and products, and uh, like LCDs, computer processors, flat panel displays, e-paper, MEMS and microfluidics devices and sensors, which are used in cell phones, automotive and, or medical devices. And that's just a small subset of, um, uh, of applications and products. Um, I think it's amazing to know that in almost all objects, when it uh, comes to technology, it always has to start with a pattern. So uh, that's why I'm, uh, I'm personally, I'm very passionate about lithography because I have at least this vision that uh, somewhere in anything that we uh, now handle, um, uh, you know, as, uh, as geeks or as technology uh, people, uh, somewhere there is something in there that has to start with a very small pattern and it has to be made somehow. Um, so how is that done? So I mean, uh, for uh, in, in the in the, uh, in the sense of uh, packaging, I mean, uh, uh, we use lithography media, and uh, something that uh, that we know is uh, to create patterns is, uh, for example, stencils. Uh, they have been used for many years, and they're here to stay for microelectronic electronics because um, uh, they can uh, they can typically get pitches down to 100 micron. And based on my visits at the meetings of IMAPS New England in Boxborough, um, uh, this is what probably most people or many people are uh, already familiar with. And then uh, for higher resolutions, uh, we have been using photolithography, where we have been using polymer films um, that are patterned. Uh, 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 so emulsion layers on pol polymer films, and they can typically uh, achieve resolutions down to 25 micron. And they are used as a as a contact mask um, uh, on, the, on the contact aligner. And when Heidelberg Instruments started out in doing large area lithography for packaging applications, a large number of our customers, uh, like mask shops, um, were still writing on emulsion film. But um, since the cost of photo masks have come down and the requirements and specifications uh, have become more critical, we rarely see uh, our customers still writing emulsion films. And the tools to do that, that maybe don't have the, the high precision, um, so like drum plotters, uh, that is typically used now for, for these uh, films. Um, for higher resolution, we've been seeing the use of photo masks. And um, in the low, low end, um, in the low end um, uh, they still use emulsion, but then, um, uh, it's basically emulsion on glass, and then for higher end, higher accuracy, people use uh, chrome on glass or quartz masks, um, and they are used. Uh, that's whether you use uh, soda lime, so glass or or quartz. That depends on the requirements in resolution and registration of, of, of the application. So, uh, with chrome on quartz, uh, we typically have the resolutions for optical lithography down to three hundred nanometer are possible and registration uh, of well below 100 nanometers. So for advanced packaging, um, actually, uh, um, uh, there are new advanced packaging where they use chiplets that can pr be produced in diff different technology nodes. And th this is a big deal is that we now can um, complete devices, uh, mix and matching uh, different, uh, different technology nodes and so the, 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 the highest resolution required does no longer really define what process uh, or what node we have to uh, create uh, a chip in. So we can actually use different chiplets with different functionalities, mix and match them, and um, that uh, can also lead to a, a, a huge, huge cost reduction and more flexibility. Um, and so, because of this, actually, uh, packaging becomes now way more important than uh, than it was. I mean, it was always important to go from the, uh, you know, the nano world to the micro world and to find these these interfaces to larger features. Uh, but now, um, actually, um, the uh, uh, the packaging is part of the uh, of, of the functionality of a complete complete design. And so. Um, uh, it will be more and more imp important um, to achieve higher resolutions and position accuracy for uh, interconnection between chiplets as you know the um, the requirements also increase in 
uh, what data rates they want to reach or the density of the interconnects uh, that they want to have. And um, so for packaging applications, we now see a, a large range of resolution requirements based on packaging technology, ranging in the low end from 100 micron uh, lines and spaces the minimum lines and space requirements be 200 nanometers in the future. Modern packaging applications will use interfaces on redistribution layers where the required line width is constantly decreased as chiplets are placed closer together while maintaining uh, signal, signal quality um, or, or even increasing uh, uh, data rates uh, that are required. One of the newer tools that uh, uh, that are dedicated for making photo masks is the Ultra Semiconductor Laser Writer, uh, which is designed for photo masks in the 150 nanometer node. Um, so this doesn't sound like uh, you know the highest node that's available, but um, you have to keep in mind that of all the photo masks, I think more than 90% uh, are actually written in this uh, area. So uh, there's actually a, a uh, that's the bulk of photo mass that is produced in photo. Um, so these tools can write uh, 500 nanometer features uh, at very high throughput. And uh, the system uh, features two uh, high-powered, high-speed uh, special light modulators that are set up in a finely tuned physical uh, arrangement. So they expose in parallel to, uh, to reach a high throughput. Um, in combination with a, a highly accurate stage mechanics and metrology, the ultra semiconductor laser writer provides a high image quality, CD uniformity, overlay and registration. Um, the field this field proven technology is based on Heidelberg Instruments VPG series, which, which I also briefly talk about in the next slide. Um, they, uh, uh, but it has been a technology that has been around for, uh, for more than 10 years uh, in our production and so forth. Very large applications, and this is typically what we see for packaging, uh, is where uh, you have to actually use uh, large area photo masks. Um, uh, we have these VPG plus, a large uh, VPG plus large area photo mask uh, uh, manufacturing tools. Um, and they can uh, produce, uh, and this is the largest one, the v VPG 1400, um, can write a mask up to 1.4 by 1.4 meters in size. And I would like to point out that in the picture below here, you see right next to the people in front of these, the VPG 1400, there is a mask holder containing, uh, containing a very large photo mask. So, I mean, the photo mask uh, is almost as tall as a, as a small person, I would say. So, once we have a photo mask, we typically then use them uh, in a mask line or in a stepper. And so, uh, a mask aligner will expose the entire photo mask over the whole substrate in one shot. Um, and the stepper will uh, take a photo mask or reticle and then expose individual dyes in a step and repeat process over an entire wafer or panel, uh, often with a, with a 5x reduction. Uh, both systems will expose substrates um, through a template mask, which makes them very fast because it's a highly parallel imaging process. But uh, one of the big disadvantages of uh, traditional lithography, uh, like uh, we do with the steppers and the, and the mask aligners, is the mask management cycle. So any problem with the, with the photo mask is uh, replicated to each wafer, and this multiplies the problem. Um, so ultimately, uh, you have to you know, put a lot of effort uh, to make sure uh, that there are no errors, or damages, or dirt on the mask. So, Beside the obvious uh, speed advantage that photomass-based uh, systems have, photomass need a regular inspection, uh, cleaning, and archiving. And in cases where a photomask needs uh, replacement, often the whole mask set needs to re be replaced. <laughs> so with maskless lithography, the exposure systems uh, expose the design data directly without the need to order a photomask from an outside vendor. And reducing the production cycle uh, directly from design to substrate, um, um, we eliminate uh, all mask related processes. And uh, in addition, it increases the flexibility by adding the possibility to apply process uh, corrections directly to the data before uh, the exposure. 
with the flexibility of directly exposing the design data, one can add uh, things like serial numbers uh, or tracking codes to the wafers without a separate exposure step um, or uh, separate labeling equipment. But this is, would be very useful for uh, automotive or medical applications uh, or for keeping uh, sensor calibrations uh, traced. And the ability to adapt uh, the design data in maskless lithography could be very useful in packaging applications where the dye always sh um, shifts a bit after mounting. And if you want to make uh, the context to the shifted dye with a direct write process, you can distort the data according to the shift map, and then you will expose, uh, then you can uh, expose them in the, in the correct um, um, location. Another problem is uh, wafer bow or non-flat substrates, as we often see them uh, with, with panels. Um, um, they may have areas uh, exposed out of focus, which will result in uh, a change line width or reduced pattern fidelity. For mask aligners, this is often compensated by pressing the mask to the substrate, uh, which reduces the lifetime of the mask and introduces defects uh, resulting in a lower yield or the need to actually repair or exchange the photo mask. Also, mask aligners uh, often use a contact mode to achieve the highest possible resolution that they can get. So to address these and other complications, we have introduced the MLA 300 recently at the, at the Productronica. And I believe that this tool has a future in particular in advanced packaging applications. So the MLA 300 was designed for industry standard 12-inch um, substrates and uh, will make will uh, expose a minimum feature size at 1.5 micron um, for lines and spaces and actually uh, no for for an isolated feature or for two microns uh, for lines and spaces uh, we'll be adding um, uh, additional uh, uh, write modes or uh, or optical modules that will be able to write uh, one micron or a faster one um, uh, module uh, that writes uh, four micron minimum feature size um, uh, to enable mix and match uh, capabilities. And um, the tool uh, as it is right now can achieve a frontline uh, overlay accuracy of better than 500 nanometers. And the MLA 300 is, uh, is based on uh, what we call a dynamic mask. In this case, it's a DMD uh, digital micro device that we uh, know from, uh, from the overhead projectors. Um, uh, you know, it's the uh, DMD is uh, made by Texas Instruments and has a um, is uh, is known to be uh, stable in the field. Um, uh, it's been used for over 20 years in large numbers, and so uh, we can expose directly from a CAT design um, such um, uh, data, uh, CAT output data such as uh, SIF or GDS2 or DXF uh, pattern um, uh, to the substrate. And the data, uh, to do this, the data is fractured in real time during the exposure. And so if you look at the diagram here, uh, we expose the substrate in stripes and uh, scroll the image across the DMD as we expose. And each time we reach a certain position, the scanning direction, uh, in the scanning direction, so the scanning direction um, goes along this uh, the, the long scanning axis. Uh, then, so each time it reaches a certain position, we trigger a flash with a high-powered laser source, which exposes the current DMD image to the substrate. At the same time, we correct uh, corrections are performed with the feedback from the interferometer and from the outer focus control system. So after each flash, flash the DMD is then reloaded with a new image. With this uh, flexibility in the exposure method, this exposure method provides you can add dynamic corrections uh, and features. Uh, to the data just before exposure, which gives you uh, many new possibilities. And so one of the key requirements aside from resolution and throughput uh, is the throughput. And actually, this has always been looked at as a as kind of a downside for direct write um, uh, lithography and um, one of the main reasons to stay with Photomask. But uh, we integrated um, uh, actually a very high speed uh, MEMS device or the DMD and integrated all these, expo uh, these optics into uh, exposure modules and, um, um, and uh, use a very strong laser to expose it. So uh, we have enough uh, energy to expose the, the substrates. 
uh, the wavelengths can uh, either be 375 or 405 or both. So we can expose either eyeline or broadband resists. And uh, this gives us a throughput of uh, for a four inch area in, uh, of just under three minutes. And uh, for a 300 by 300 millimeter in less than uh, in, in about 18 minutes. But um, you will also be able to have two or four modules effectively doubling or quadrupling the throughput of the tool. Um, this is still uh, under development, but it should be uh, be available uh, next year. And uh, these um, modules are uh, fully integrated, so they can basically all put on a system that uh, has one module. We can easily transfer it to uh, add uh, another module in the field. Um, due to uh, CTE mismatch, <coughs> um, large wafers with multiple layers can also become warped or both. And so the MLA 300 can handle these warped wafers uh, through its special wafer handling system using special end effectors. You can also use a customized vacuum chuck which, um, with an optimized vacuum distribution to help flatten the, uh, the panel or the wafers. And then uh, any residual topography can be handled by a continuous autofocus system that really continuously tracks um, uh, with extended compensation range. And so the real-time out of the MLA 300 also increases yield and device uh, uh, uniformity. With a fixed mass, you will always have one plane over the whole area in focus as the exposure is done in one flash. Um, if there are corrugations on the surface, some of these areas will be out of focus. So as you can imagine, sections that are exposed out of focus will have a changed line width or sharp features uh, get rounded off in, compar in comparison to the intended outcome. The real-time out of focus used in the MLA 300 follows the surface uh, during the exposure and keeps everything in focus and uniform. The first customers found that the out of focus increased the yield uh, from around 75% to 95% without changing any any of the other uh, process steps. And so there are many applications uh, where un unwanted topography is an issue. For example, with, with sensors and electronic components where the ceramic substrates have uh, thickness variations. Uh, in packaging applications, the mounted chips, uh, they, they may be of different uh, thickness or actually uh, 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 may, be, may be mounted in, in different heights. More conventional semiconductor processes, they, they use a planarization steps um, to avoid that. Um, but it takes a lot of time and costs and um, may be possible to reduce that uh, by using uh, this, this uh, kind of an autofocus system. As the throughput is seen as one of the main drawbacks to direct light lithography, I would like to show how it's possible to add additional modules for higher throughput. But this is a view of how the exposure happens with multiple modules to in, uh, increase throughput. In this case, we use two modules to write a 300 by 300 millimeter area. And each of the modules writes one section on parallel to the, uh, to the other module, which effectively doubles the throughput. In total, it will be possible to have up to four modules installed on one system, where then each module will write one quadrant of the 300 millimeter write area, quadrupling the throughput. And here's a view of the global alignment functionality, uh, how the global alignment functionality can be used to compensate for offset, scaling, and shearing. After measuring the location of the uh, global alignment marks, the software calculates the required transformation of, to overlay the new pattern onto the existing pattern. Offset is compensated by substrate positioning, rotation, scaling, and shearing is compensated by transformation of the pattern. This is an important feature to realize mix and match with other tool sets, such as steppers, E-beams, mask aligners, uh, et cetera. Also, it is notable that at least scaling and shearing correction is very hard. And this is just a matter of a, of a new exposure parameter. Some process steps may be co cause localized or nonlinear distortions from processing at uh, elevated temperatures, especially when uh, stresses have built up. These might be a bit more gradual in character. To compensate for these uh, local distortions, we can apply a correction matrix to the coordinate system uh, of the tool to remap the devices to the actual location without modifying the exposure uh, design. But on the other hand, 
It is also possible to compensate for die shift and rotations when working on uh, wafer level packaging applications where dies may become shifted or rotated, as you see here, uh, the red would show the intended location of the dies. In reality, um, the locations would uh, differ slightly. Um, so if you look at the uh, blue dies, they show the actual position, uh, position on the wafer. And the location and the rotation of the dies could be measured uh, by, by a metrology tool. Um, and then uh, the design, uh, let's say for the interconnects could be then adapted based on the uh, measured dies. So this would be then uh, in green, it would be then that adaptive design. And so uh, keep in mind that the location of the dies are shown for uh, interposer or re redistribution layers. Uh, for interposer or redistribution layers, the interconnects would then be um, betw between the individual dies. So basically you can see here that 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 then would match the actual location. Um, here are some exposure images uh, for you to see. Um, as you can see, we spec uh, one and a half micron minimum feature size uh, uh, for an isolated line or two micron uh, lines and spaces. Um, you can see here that we can get uh, the, uh, uh, down to easily down to one micron, but we like to have some buffer uh, when we spec out our tools. And uh, it's possible to uh, integrate uh, uh, automation into the tool so that uh, uh, and, and the tool has a, a relatively large uh, footprint with or without these automation options. So the tool uh, has a footprint of less than th three square meters by itself and adding the automation would add uh, four and a half, uh, would add one and a half square meters for the loader. Uh, <clears throat> We also offer a sex gem in interface for integration with facil facility production management systems. So in summary, I hope that I could show that, that the direct write lithography uh, can fill a gap between low volume uh, R&D applications and high volume manufacturing by increasing the flexibility and significantly lowering the cost uh, for a production cycle. The MLA 300 uh, shown here can be equipped with a 375 and or four or five nanometer exposure wavelengths to allow you uh, to use processes that use eyeline or broadband photoresists. We're following the requirements for packaging applications uh, and are currently developing a higher resolution option as well as a lower resolution option for higher throughput. Due to the ability of adding up to four module, modules, of, um, this opens up the possibility of mix and match between these resolutions as well. Uh, I would like to thank you now for, uh, you know, uh, paying attention uh, uh, and uh, um, I would like to open the webinar now for, for questions. Well, um, I'd like to start uh, with the questions. Can you comment on uh, the application of this method to large formats such as uh, uh, panels and PC boards? Yeah, so uh, this tool has been, um, uh, designed to do up to 300 by 300 millimeters. Um, but we do have other tools as well that can uh, scale up to that size of, uh, you know, um, 1.4 by 1.4 meters would just be a different technology. Um, throughput uh, would be would, might also be different. But uh, for example, the VPG systems that I mentioned, they are um, able to to easily switch between resolutions. So you could do, uh, you know, coarse resolution at a very high throughput, um, uh, even faster than what you can see here at the MLA 300 current. And do you think this would be competitive with the uh, uh, Mylar mask exposure, uh, co contact exposure? Uh, so I think um, uh, it's maybe not directly competitive. I think in that case, um, the requirements are um, of the end products are not high enough to to justify the the cost of um, of a tool like the MLA 300. Um, uh, but as we see that the packaging applications are going to you know smaller and smaller feature sizes, and also uh, to points where the registration has become is becoming more and more important, that uh, you really can't do with Mylar at that point. So I think. It's not the question. I think if the, there's lots of applications where, you know, a mylar, um, or, um, uh, you know, or a flexible um, uh, a mask is uh, is sufficient, and it will stay sufficient. 
but there will be other applications uh, coming more and more that, uh, um, that that will become standard actually that would require some uh, kind of direct write um, uh, lithography step. So you would would you say that this this would pick up at the uh, point where the standard methods uh, uh, start to become inadequate? Yeah, so I think, uh, um, as I said before, I think um, these Mylar masks, you have to look at the, you know, the region where they start to struggle and that's around one mil, right? So 20, 25 micron, um, anything, any requirement below that, I would start looking either at, uh, you know, um, heart masks or um, at maybe a direct write application. And uh, as I say, I mean, there's still a lot of justification for uh, using a stepper or a mask aligner, uh, but there's uh, a lot of uh, new applications coming around that will become standard that will ask for these um, direct write uh, lithography steps. Okay. Um, I, somebody raised his hand. So yeah. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Jeroen de Boer from uh, KNS. Um, I have a question regarding the wavelength. So most of the stepper use a mercury lamp and um, they also have a G line that's used in broad uh, band exposures. Yeah. Um, uh, and what is your experience with the direct right and not having a G line? Uh, did you yeah. did you see so, any uh, interesting stuff? So we, uh, uh, we have had other tools uh, around and we actually keep track of uh, many different photoresists that we have uh, exposed in our uh, process application lab in Heidelberg. And uh, uh, so for eyeline, we use a 375 nanometer laser, which is very close um, to, to the eyeline. Um, and then uh, actually many eyeline resists are actually broadband resists, so they can be exposed at a longer wavelength. And so for uh, for G line, we use a four and four or five nanometer laser. Yes. And we have some other tools that can use um, a different wavelengths, like the VPG systems. They use three fifty five nanometers. Also, these lasers are usually chosen to be close to one of those those lines of the mercury. Yeah. There are no particular issues that you uh, ran into with um, with customers or uh, with with different materials. So, um, no, not really. I mean, uh, uh, usually what uh, we run into is what, what you would also run into with, um, with other tools. So let's say we use um, um, a longer wavelength, like uh, we want to expose an eye line with, a, with, a, uh, with 405 nanometer, uh, so uh, use it as a broadband resist, then the sensitivity of the resist will be significantly lower at that point. Um, then you need uh, more laser power. Um, so these are fairly regular uh, issues that you would also run into if you were, um, you know, just changing your process. Okay, thank you for your explanation. Okay, we have a question yeah. from... Uh, that's me, TR. Hi. Hello? Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, are these uh, laser wavelengths tunable a little bit? No. Um, so. Basically, uh, they're not tunable. Actually, they uh, we try to keep them uh, at a very uh, small uh, uh, bandwidth um, uh, around the uh, four or five or, or, um, or three seventy five nanometer. Okay. So typically, these wavelengths are actually good enough for uh, for the for the bulk or for most resists. Yeah. Um, so we've not seen um, so far many resists that um, that you couldn't do with it. Uh, the only uh, thing where people were asking for, uh, you know, uh, deep UV uh, wavelengths or something like that, which we obviously don't have yet. Hi, I have a question. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Tom. I have a question about, about the, hi, thank you for your, uh, for your talk. Um, I have a question about the overlay accuracy and what technology you use for, for um, aligning subsequent layers. And yes. Also the uh, stitching accuracy. So um, the overlay accuracy um, for the uh, MLA 300, so for that particular tool, um, is uh, 500 nanometers um, for uh, for global alignment. So, um, and the stitching accuracy. So so as you uh, um, see it right, I mean the stitching accuracy 
is important because we expose it stripe by stripe and we want these uh, stripes to connect. Um, we specify that as a 20 nanometers for a two micron minimum feature size. So typically you would want to have that uh, number in the range of this uh, CD uniformity uh, request uh, requirement. Uh, so that is about a tenth of the, um, of the minimum feature size. So we're well below that. Okay, and is that uh, stitching held across the different modules when you have multiple modules? Yes. So that's uh, part of our expertise and uh, our long-term expertise is uh, that we are, um, uh, throughout all our products, we, we are dealing with stitching issues. And so that is something that we, uh, um, that we are very good at. And how often is calibration required and what does that entail? Um, so the tool uh, is supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, basically cali uh, calibration free. Uh, uh, the only things that uh, you would need to do as a as a user of the tool is to uh, uh, basically keep your process parameters. So some of that uh, basically is a standard process. You would find, um, you know, you would basically uh, make a bosom plot. So you do a focus and energy um, uh, a test. And uh, that can be done uh, very easily. So there is a, a, a way to set uh, the range of focus and energies that you want to, to do, and then it will automatically uh, make an exposure for you. And you can just read off um, uh, which one exposure is the best. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions? Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank our uh, guest speaker. Um, I, I enjoyed your talk very much. And thank you. Uh, um, if you have, if 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 any of you have uh, any questions that occur to you after the fact, I believe you have my email and uh, and Harvey Smith's email. So uh, um, feel free to contact us uh, with any comments, suggestions about. Uh, um, the presentation or anything about the meeting itself, because uh, obviously this is the first time we've tried this and uh, we're interested in making it work. And uh, so anything we can do to uh, make this go better the next time, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. Yes, uh, thanks for uh, having me as a test subject here. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, yeah. I enjoy talking uh, about uh, uh, our lithography tools a lot. And uh, if anyone wants uh, you wants me to do a, another talk like this, um, I'm happy to do that also for uh, individual customers or, or potential customers. So Good. it's a lot of fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering how we were going to do that. Yeah, yeah that worked. That worked out fine. I'm blushing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well then. Oh, uh, oh um, I I did have a question through the chat. Um, can, uh, will you will you be making the slides available? Uh, I have to double check, but uh, I think uh, yes. I I will. Um, I will let you know tomorrow, uh, Richard, but uh, I think I can make the slides available. Okay. And yeah? So, um, so once he, once he has done that, uh, you can, uh, uh, anyone can contact uh, myself or Matt or Harvey uh, to get a copy. And everyone is also free, feel, feel free to contact me as well. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.